Welcome to another episode of the Battlefields and Bourbon Podcast. I'm Jack, joined as always by my co-host Elijah. And we're coming to you from the historic Bell House in beautiful downtown Winchester, which is preserved by the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields National Historic District, the official sponsor of the Battlefields and Bourbon Podcast. This is episode 20, and we are excited for this episode today. But before we get any further, I'll hand it off to Elijah to talk about our whiskey for today's episode, as well as some other exciting uh, announcements. Alrighty, so to, today we've got uh, Catoctin Creek's Round Stone Rye Whiskey. Uh, this is their 92 proof expression. Um, they do have an 80 proof as well, but we're going with a 92 today. Um, Catoctin Creek, based out of Purcellville, Virginia, um, they do their stuff with 100% rye in the mash bill, so there's no corn, malted barley, anything else like that um, included in it. So this is just 100% rye. Um, not sure how long they age it for. I think it's like two years, maybe a little less, just because I'm pretty sure they still use quarter casts instead of the uh, usual 53-gallon barrels that most bigger distilleries will use. Um, but yeah, we can, can crack this one open. I'm not sure what the cork pop's going to be like on a little bottle, but... Pretty right, so good. That was solid. That was decent. But uh, yeah, we're doing a rye whiskey tonight, so nothing too... And we've done Catoctin, a Catoctin product before the ragnarok, ragnarok limited release yeah so we're excited to have them back on yeah it was a good local product like to support local when we can but uh in other news hand this over to our guest yeah pour, pour what he wants in other news um if you're looking for something to do as of the recording of this episode um coming up april 6 2024 the uh, tredegar society with the american civil war museum uh, down in Richmond, Virginia, is hosting the Loose Cannons number 10 uh, event. And uh, this is just going to be like a good good time for all, a little party, kind of fundraising event, just, you know, Civil yeah. War, but as well as, you know, just having a good time and trying to bring some interest towards, you know, Civil War history. Um, I know they had said there's going to be some musket live fire, some other Civil War-related activities as well, but food, drink, um, sponsored by... Uh, a Smith Bowman Distillery out in Fredericksburg. So they'll among, be there. Yep, among some other people. Um, Shenandoah Valley Battlefields National Historic District is also uh, contributing to this one, so our sponsor is going to pitch in there. Um, so we're just trying to help out as much as we can there as well. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to make it to that one, unfortunately. However, uh, we are sending down some of our uh, custom engraved uh, Battlefields and Bourbon Glencairn glasses and some uh, stickers for their raffle. So if you're down there, you can go um, check out the raffle. Might be able to win you a glass if you didn't win one the last time. Um, and there was one other thing with that. Um, yeah, the event's 21 plus. Yep. Dress code, smart casual. Yep. I was there at Loose Cannons number nine, which is, like Elijah was saying, it's the fundraiser for the Tredegar Society. So they're supporting. Uh, you know, nonprofit to uh, the American Civil War Museum, both the Appomattox location and the um, the, the uh, Richmond uh, at location as well. Um, it's just a great event, great food, great company. This year, there's a special guest. Uh, Fritz Klein is going to be portraying Abraham Lincoln, so he'll be there. Lincoln will be there, um, and it's just a great time in a beautiful location in downtown Richmond. Um, yeah, if you're looking for a way to uh, attend, um, we have the Eventbrite link to their sign up um, for tickets in our Linktree bio, um, Facebook and Instagram. You can find it there, um, and that'll be good until, I guess, the day before the event, so April 5th. Um, it'll be on our bio, um, so you can sign up that way if you want to attend. Yeah, so let's uh, get into our whiskey, our rye whiskey today. Yeah, kind of already introduced yeah, it, so let's just yeah. give it a little, a little nosing, a little... It's got that. We've musty. got Mike. We got Mike Kehoe as our guest, and we'll we'll t- ask him a little bit more about himself here in a second. <laughs> He's going in for the sip. It's a what proof? Ninety two. Yes. Not bad. It's, yeah. It's got that spice from from the rye, but it's also got that musty, dusty that you like, Jack. <laughs> oh yeah. So <clears throat> when you go to um, Catoctin and their distillery or their little. Uh, set up in downtown Persville. They have a flight you can do. And they make a bunch of other different spirits. And they have a lot of their Roundstone Rye collection where it's, you know, their 80, what was it, 82? 80, 80 and then 92. 80, 92, and then there's a cask strength mm-hmm. um, one, which I'm sure we'll do in the future. 
Um, and I, my favorite was the 90, what is this? 92, 92, 92. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's just more complexity, more flavor. I felt with this one, than the lower proof and then the higher proof is higher proof. So you're just getting, you know, high proof whiskey, yeah. um, which has its own flavors in and of itself. But I definitely recommend this to anybody. It's, they also have like a honey heat, uh, hot honey whiskey too. Yeah. I don't know if it's still around, but it def- when I was there, they had it and that was an interesting flavor. Um, but I'm a big fan of this and I'm glad we'll be sipping on this one today. And Mike Kehoe, our guest that's here today, uh, first time guest, very special guest. Mike, what are your thoughts right off the bat? Well, of this? first thought was uh, when you all invited me over here for B&B, I thought you were talking about basketball. <laughs> <laughs> it is so, March Madness. So. <laughs> I was expecting hot wings and, you know, so this is be- not too bad. It's yeah. uh, better than the old treachery that I had. <laughs> <laughs> not too long ago. Yeah. But uh, I'm not a much of a bourbon person, so. And that's fine. Well, but, that's good because uh, it's, yeah. But it's uh, palatable. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Good. No, that's good. We always, it's always an interesting experience when we have guests on because not everybody's a bourbon or whiskey person. So to get their thoughts right away, like Aaron, who's a reoccurring guest, he's always pounding them. The first, the first <laughs> glass he gets, he shots it straight down. Mike Robinson did the thing, same thing. Um, some of our other guests don't even drink like Nick, Nick Paserno, he'll drink on occasion, but he, mm-hmm. he opted out, which is fine. It's not all about that. We definitely want to bring something to, uh, your ears that is good to listen to and, and a good, uh, whiskey to recommend, but, um, it's not for everybody, but it's interesting when we get the different reactions from our guests. Varying um, perspectives from varying palettes and levels of experience. It's always, uh, it gives our listeners a well-rounded, uh, opinion or thought on the, the whiskey that we're talking about too. And this is pretty easy to find, I think, in oh, ABC yeah. stores. Yeah. So liquors, I don't know how far around the eastern East Coast they distribute, but I know I've seen them in ABC stores here in Virginia, and obviously you can get them from their in-store location in Percival, Virginia. Um, yeah, they're, I think, in every pretty much every Virginia ABC. I've seen them out of state as well. Okay. I'm not sure how far they reach. I think there's even, like, international distribution as well but i mean they're pretty they, popular they're award they're winning popular. too i think yeah. in their rise oh yeah you know they, they've definitely won a few so it's cool to uh have someone local that uh is making a big name for themselves yeah i'm excited I'm, i was excited to do it and um i think it's that rusty dusty smell you were talking about is just what makes me love rise even more um so i was excited to do this one and we'll do more rise in the future but um, getting into today's topic, which is Camp Russell, uh, a, a union camp located in Frederick County um, during the Civil War. But before we get into a little bit more about Camp Russell, talk a little bit more about Mike Kehoe. Mike, tell us a little bit more about yourself and the background uh, of you and, and your connection to the Civil War. Grew up on the uh, battlefield of Cedar Creek, uh, 1950s. 60s, uh, pre-metal detecting days. So uh, what's that in the ground? It has three rings and it's the white colored. You know, yeah. I thought it was a Chris- Christmas tree ball, but it turned <laughs> out to be a Civil War bullet. Yeah. And uh, so that sparked my interest. I was six years old. And after that, we would uh, look for them, you know, if it was a hard rain or f- in the garden. So you grow up on a battlefield, you just sort of have an innate interest what happened there yeah and uh i remember 1960 61 there was a tremendous storm uh summer storm at fisher's hill which was on the other side of town for me about five or six miles and all the boys in town went out and rode their bicycles out and were picking up bullets at tumbling run it was a flash flood and i decided to well, maybe it happened here because we had the same storm, and I found a lot of uh, Civil War bullets and, and washed out gullies and streams in my first uh, U.S. buckle. Wow. Nice. So just naturally yeah. the environment, and at the same time, you know, airheads and just uh, the whole history of the area, I took an interest in it. And also my my, bro- my siblings, my two brothers mm-hmm. and my sister all have, have the same interest. Yeah. But did it develop through the whole relic you know, relation as well as living on a battlefield. Well, uh, different for each of them. It was during centennial years, and yeah. of course, we were studying it uh, in school, and 
there's also Strasburg's bicentennial. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole, we were just inundated with history yeah. at that time. And uh, a lot of the, my peers uh, still, you know, have, have a good innate interest in the history mm-hmm. because of the time we grew up in. Uh, the valley had not changed a whole lot, probably from the Civil War. Uh, you know, this the, is pre-81, right? Pre- yeah, pre-81. And uh, 81 changed things quite yeah. a bit and continues to do so. But, you know, going on through school and then to college, you know, I always uh, still kept an interest in Civil War history. And I got into metal detecting as well. Mm-hmm. I'd been in, in the archaeology before that. But it, uh, it was just uh, something that uh, sort of innate interest from the environment, to me anyway, to, you know, the Civil War history of, of where we lived. Yeah. And how have you carried that on through your life and then maybe career? You know, how did you take that passion you had and, you know, keep it going? Well, I guess uh, I was different than some felt people because uh, I'd be out where well, the guys are down at Strasburg Pool watching the girls. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm out in the woods looking for Civil War bu- bullets and buttons. <laughs> so, you know. But it just, uh, a lot of people have a collective uh, uh, interest, and that was uh, what I did. And I always kept everything spe- specific to the site. In mm-hmm. other words, I didn't throw in a bunch of bullets in a bucket, and I could try to keep it specific and have a little bit of a story to tell. So that was pre you being involved with you know, professional archaeology. Right. Being on that scene, at a young age, you were naturally drawn to the idea of cataloging, cataloging keeping track. Was that because... Well, it was partly because that's what we did with the Indian artifacts. We were told uh, that you should keep it site-specific. Okay. And it just carried on into the uh, Civil War collections. Um, We didn't realize it because uh, the older generation, I'm, you know, a baby boomer, Mm -hmm. the uh, World War II generation uh, had already been checking the battlefields for you know, 10 years probably yeah. in the 50s. Um, I remember Bill Gavin started early on, and he'd found a 1,000 buckles by the, probably 1965 or something. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> he, his 1,000 buckle, he wrote an M on it, on the back of it. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was, you know, we were just speaking here a little bit ago about a wheelbarrow load of yeah. relics. Well, that was never the case. You know, you yeah. might find a pocket full. But it was hard. It was hard work, and it came uh, a little at a time. Um, and it, also, the information back then was uh, misinformation. It's uh, a lot more no- a lot more knowledge about it. And more books have been written about the specific types of bullets they had, buttons. You know, it's a lot of people spent a lot of time uh, studying Civil yeah. War, the uh, the munitions, the guns, weapons, everything. And it's gotten really, really, most of the information has been down in the national archives all yeah. along, but it, you know, that's like, how do you get into that? Yeah. It's, uh, it's very time consuming. No yeah. internet then to make things no like internet, streamlined or anything like uh, that. Internet made things a lot easier. Uh, anyway, I thought, uh, people probably have not heard of Camp Russell. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've heard of the battlefields, you know, Third Battle, Kernstown, Cedar Creek. But I don't know how many people are aware of, in the just general public, about what was called Camp Russell. And Camp Russell was in Frederick County. Uh, and it probably, at, in 1864, and it was a par- probably the largest population in Frederick County, and w- including Winchester, until the 1970s. Uh, when Sheridan had an army of around 35,000 men living camp there yeah. for a couple months. Yeah. And we're talking about Frederick County, Virginia. I just remembered, I was like, there might be people that don't know what Frederick County we're talking yeah. about. So this is Frederick County, Virginia. Yeah. So Winchester, where we're recording this episode at about, what would you say, six or eight miles south of where we are right now? South of Kernstown. Yeah. So about south of, and, yeah. And today, Kernstown and Winchester. The and same thing. Pretty much all the way down Route 11 to Stephen yeah. City has all been blended yeah. into a, a commercial corridor. That's another topic, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, Camp Russell was um, after the Battle of Cedar Creek. Uh, Which took place October 19, 1864. 
uh, Sheridan stayed on that battlefield and campsite until November the 8th. And because their supply line was uh, at Stevenson's Depot north of Winchester, he decided to pull back uh, closer to a supply line. And part of it was probably, probably because most of these guys were attacking it, you know, supply trains all the time, and he was stretched. So uh, Mosby, uh, probably uh, Gilmore, and some other uh, cavalry, uh, you know, battalions were giving him a hard time. So he pulled back to the outskirts of Winchester uh, and set up camp. The, the cavalry, uh, there were three cavalry divisions, uh, first, second, and third. Custer had the third division. He was on the right flank. Uh, General Merritt, who was uh, second division, he was in sort of the right center flank. And then Powell's division, uh, G uh, Colonel Powell, had uh, what was the cavalry of the West Army of West Virginia, and they were on the east flank around five, where the 522 corridor is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a large uh, half circle of camps all, all the way from east of Winchester to almost Route 50 around the southern and western edge of, of uh, Winchester. Wow, I didn't know it went that and far. And it was probably, let's see, it's, I would say it's five or six miles. Yeah, that's you know? good clear from one southern end of modern-day Winchester all the way around. And, and much of it was, was entrenched, uh, yeah. particularly where the 8th Corps, or Army of West Virginia, uh, had, they had built forts, uh, and they were on the the right flank of, of Powell's uh, cavalry division. Probably each one of the cavalry divisions had probably two or 3,000 horses. Uh, the Union cavalry actually outnumbered uh, General Jubal Early's infantry. Wow. <laughs> he probably had 8,000 infantry at this time, and I would imagine the cavalry was eight or 9,000. <laughs> I'm going to say horses. Yeah. That also included... Uh, men riding them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, men riding them and that many sabers. But uh, so the cavalry was on the outside, and they were constantly going back and forth doing forays to uh, Fisher's Hill to see where they check on the Confederates. The Confederates at this time are at Newmarket in the end of October, part of November, regrouping from the losses, the triple losses of Third Winchester, Fisher's Hill, and uh, and Cedar Creek, and their their numbers had dwindled from probably a high strength in the, in August, uh, mid-August, of around 18,000 men. That's including Kershaw, correct? Yeah. Okay. They had dwindled down probably to probably five or 6,000. Mm. Some of the soldiers were sent back to uh, uh, to Lee and Richmond. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them were just captured mm -hmm. or wounded or had deserted. You know, the, that was the attrition that had started – uh, it's just funny that a few months before they were they, they were a match for Sheridan's 35,000 men and or more. After Cedar Creek, did um, did Early, ha did Early have an, uh, Sheridan have an idea of what Early's numbers were? Because, you know, prior, during the Mimic War period, pre-3rd yeah. Winchester, no one had a clue of what the numbers were per side, overestimating, underestimating. So after Cedar Creek, did Sheridan feel comfortable with Early's strength and position, or did he, was it uncertain and kind of stayed on a defensive? I think it was always uncertain, but they also had a lot of people on the ground, civilians that told him they had a pretty good idea that what his strength was, and they just left him alone at Newmarket. Yeah, they didn't uh, pursue him. Uh, once on November the 22nd, they went that way, and they had it was a cavalry skirmish at Roots Hill. But anyway, after Cedar Creek, after this uh, – uh, I guess the last skirmish was November 12th. Uh, they call it the Battle of Nineveh. Mm -hmm. It was actually took place on, on the cavalry, both flanks of the cavalry, on Cedar Creek Grade, Middle Road, and uh, Front Royal Road. Uh, Early had come up from Newmarket and uh, stayed one night at Fisher's Hill and then advanced as far as Stephen City or Newtown. And they just looked at each other except for the cavalry on mm. each side. There were some casualties. Uh, Confederates lost their cannons again and, and captured, and they went back to Newmarket. And that was pretty much it. 
And after that, uh, Sheridan pulled back to Kernstown and closer to the supply base. So I've said the uh, cavalry was on the two flanks. The Eighth Corps was on the left flank of the uh, of the well, the left of the road, uh, Valley Pike. Okay. Between the Valley Pike and 522, and it's about where 37 now is. So if or, we're if we're looking at it from like a bird's eye view, when you say left, are you talking west or east of the Valley Pike? When I say left, I'm I'm looking south, so it would be east of the Valley Pike. Okay. And. Uh, so the Federals are facing south. Yes. Uh, okay. And the 19th Corps was, uh, part of it was where the the um, Bowman Library is, mm-hmm. stretching from there all the way over to Middle Road. Wow. And uh, that would take care of... Um, On the north side of the Opekin. Well, there was actually a, a brigade south of the Opekin. Okay. For the first brigade. Yeah, I guess it would be south of the Opekin. Yeah. So they were there. And wherever the 19th Corps went, they entrenched. Mm-hmm. The 8th Corps entrenched somewhat, and you can still see forts in this area. It's in the woods east of um, 37, where it terminates now. Mm-hmm. All the way to 522 was the 8th Corps camps. And there's a couple of forts in there, fortifications, and uh, still some evidence of that encampment. Uh, at one time, you could walk through the woods and see where they had entrenched around uh, their tents. Mm-hmm. So you see these little contours in the ground you <laughs> yeah. see the trash pits uh it's pretty interesting and, yeah. and it was studied in the 90s uh, archaeologically so it has been mapped because 37 was to extend right through the middle of it you say was to still could happen well, i i know you've been around longer than me and you know and you have a planning and managing background with municipalities but yeah. It's still on. Oh, I'm sure it's will. still plan with air quotes plan, <laughs> but it could easily happen. It could happen. Subject it's this change. big circle bypass. And, that, and how it happen will be development. Yeah. It'll be the uh, most likely developers put it in mm-hmm. as a proffer once that is, I think it's already been subdivided. Oh yeah. So that's when it'll probably happen. But anyway, when you get to the uh, route 11 section on each side of it was the 19th core, which was probably about, Seven or 8,000 infantry in two divisions. Maybe not that many, but it, it wasn't as big as the 6th Corps. And they went across to the, the library. west from the library, Bowman Library, all the way over to... Route 11? Probably almost a middle, middle road. Okay, so all the way around. Uh, maybe not quite that far, but uh, there's a sub, subdivision over there now... Uh, an industrial road that used to be called. Oh, here's where I get forgetful. Anyway, Shady Elm. Shady Elm Road. You're right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank Helps. You. I'm looking at a map, yeah. so don't. <laughs> I, it was not my memory. And, and then the Sixth Corps. And bear in mind that the soldiers are building cabins at this time. They had because it's a, November. They're it's preparing for winter. In November, yeah. and they thought they were going to be there all winter. So they started building winter huts. Sometimes it was, uh, you know, they would dig down in the ground and put logs around it and put a tent over it, you know. And then uh, other times, some units, maybe they didn't have tents, I don't know, but they started building little cabins with chimneys, you know, made of stone and brick. Um, Sheridan gave the orders that any abandoned buildings could be dismantled to help build winter quarters. Well, in Stephen City, uh, you had the old academy uh, made of brick, that was where the town office is now. When he school, so they took it down. Hmm. There was uh, probably the old Stevens Mansion, which nobody knows where it was uh, up until recent years. It was vacant, and it was brick, and it was torn down. So if you go in the woods where the Eighth Corps was, where the Ninth Corps was, you'll see bricks. What's a brick doing here? Well, it's left over from the Civil War. Yeah, in the middle of the woods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they would take uh, you know implements, uh, stoves, frying pans from the civilians, and all this stuff was laying around for a hundred years after the war. So it's still some of it's still there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then the sixth corps took off from the right of the nineteenth corps flank and went all the way over to uh, past uh, uh, well Jackson's Woods mm-hmm. in that area, 
to Jones it's Road. Middle Road. And from then on, the cavalry uh, took con- over. Continued to sweep up to 50. about Route 50. Wow. And I understand Custer's headquarters uh, were on Route 50. The house stood until not too many years ago. It's in the area where Walmart is, or okay. actually back towards town a little bit. There's a hotel there now. Yeah, I heard it was. That was where like the off ramp or on ramp of Route mm-hmm. 37 yep. is on the 50. So you know, you have four options for that. <laughs> yeah. So if you go into Hanley Library, they have uh, newspapers still of those times, mm-hmm. and the there's interesting. Uh, news about the interaction of the civilians and the soldiers. And, of course, at the same time, the soldiers are always looking for something to eat, so they're hitting everything in the area that they can, smoke houses, cellars, uh, looting. Uh, that's typical of occupation. Uh, they had a few people that were actually, uh, there was a couple murders that took place. Wow. One girl in Winchester was murdered. And they had an execution. So you've got all, everything's bad in the news then, or now as it was then too. But it, this this, lap, this um, lasted for a couple months up until before Christmas. And they, Sheridan had determined uh, that Early was essentially was no longer a threat. Early had sent the best part of his remnants of his divisions back to General Lee in Petersburg and Richmond. So, uh, no threat. It settled down for the winter. And uh, Sheridan sent the 6th Corps back. And that was his largest uh, Army Corps. Had three divisions. And um, that was left 19th Corps, 8th Corps, and the Cavalry, which stayed all winter. I think I neglected to say how... Camp Russell got its name. Yeah. Why it was referred yeah, yeah. to. Uh, People may be wondering. Yeah. yeah. It's Colonel like, David Russell was head of the 6th Corps 1st first, first Division, mm-hmm. and he was uh, killed in the 3rd Battle of Winchester. Uh, and just about the same time at General Rhodes, uh, I think it was the same counterattack uh, at 3rd Battle uh, that they were, just General Rhodes got killed about the same time at General Russell got killed, and they were both very popular with their soldiers. Mm-hmm. In fact, the uh, Confederates named one of their camps General Rhodes. So that's how Camp Russell got its name, and just in honor of, of the Sixth Corps General. Uh, I forget what I was talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the cavalry stayed all winter. Yeah. And as time went on, uh, the railroad from Harpers Ferry to Winchester, and it was a narrow gauge railroad, mm-hmm. uh, was rebuilt, and they they were supplying more and more uh, uh, troops, uh, supplies, everything. Steve at to Stevenson Depot, it became a hub, and that's still a few miles away from Camp Russell. So Sheridan, well, after he sent the Sixth Corps back. He sent most of his troops back behind Winchester or north of Winchester to be, protect Stevenson Depot and all the bridges mm-hmm. and crossings. And he left uh, the cavalry out in the front. And that was essentially uh, what happened during that time period. And there, um, it's my understanding that a lot of the 19th Corps trench lines still exist across from the Bowman Library. Often yeah, referred there's referred to as the zigzag trench line. Yeah, there's a stretch there, and it's still it's it's grown up. I remember when Homie Hack had the property, uh, he it was farmed, and um, he had it in corn, and you could see the bricks in the cornfields, and the charcoal would come up, and you'd see buttons and bullets, and you know it's just the trash or debris that the army left behind. Uh, it actually continued on uh, to the west side of 81 and where the uh, just recent subdivision is being Mm -hmm. put in north of Stephen City that took out the remaining trench line last year that was there some of the fellows that got in there found remnants of it Mm -hmm. and um, when you got over to the 6th Corps the the dug in trenches are not as evident 
but there's still rock lines, fences, and some uh, sub evidence of trench there. But the six core didn't dig in like the other two cores. I don't know why. I Lazy, guess. maybe. Yeah, they they were all, they were the real veteran core. I was about to say they're they were probably like you know we can put up a fight. Yeah, nineteenth core guys, don't let Nick Paserno, former guest, hear this, but yeah, yeah, they they dug in and they were by the book, well, still young. Well, they just they were Banks's guys from the Red River, and uh, you know they couldn't handle the first attack at Third Winchester, so you had to put the West Virginia boys in. So. But Nick won't listen to this, so he won't ever hear that. <laughs> what, what's funny, though, is a lot of the six Corps regiments were at 2nd Winchester. Yeah. And you know what happened then. They yeah. were captured, defeated pretty badly. But they went into the Sixth Corps, and sort of the, now they're, that's what they're mostly known for. But it's just it's leadership well, the mule, and like circumstances. Spotsylvania, they were heavily engaged yeah. there. Yeah. Um, yeah, they become a, hard, a super hardened regiment. Yeah. Same thing with those men from what end up being the eighth corps the army of west virginia all of crook's men they get they get you know sharpened throughout 1864 and it's just not the same for the 19th corps by the time the valley campaign starts in that fall Mm -hmm. Um, yeah it's my understanding with that zigzag trench line looking at it from some lidar too i've seen that there is a remnant of that trench line in the median of of interstate 81 I believe that's so. And I've looked at aerial photography from like the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, whenever they were doing 81. And you can see they left it untouched. <laughs> so they just put their, their lanes in and mm-hmm. left the median pretty much untouched. Um, but that's a very prominent, when you're looking at LIDAR imagery of the area, that zigzag trench line is very, very prominent. Um, well, I remember, uh, and I did, you know, 1974, I got married. And that Christmas, I was going to Winchester to get. And it was Christmas Eve. I wait till the last minute <laughs> to <laughs> get a, a present for my wife. And I'm driving down the road with my brother, I believe, or I was riding with him. And I looked to the east side of Route 11, and I did a double take. And right there, you're talking about. Mm-hmm. I saw a fort. Yeah. I said, I can't be, because I didn't know anything about yeah. that. And so a few days later, I went over there, and yes, sir, it was a fort. And that's when I started, first became aware of of, uh, Camp Russell. Where was this on 11? Uh, It's, uh, the fort is still there on Carysbrook Farm. Oh, yeah. But I was traveling 81, I should say. And, um, but that ground was open then. It was still farmland, Mm -hmm. and and so much of it. Was it like a crescent-shaped, like a C? Yeah. Yeah, and you it's, could see it's it from eighty one. It's still there, but, but you could actually see it from eighty one. Yeah, you can't at that see time. it today. It's all wooded. And uh, so, was do you know if the Parkins Mill Battery was a part of Camp Russell? I believe it was, but it was probably built uh, prior. Probably may have been built earlier, and it may have been enhanced even after afterwards. The Union Army stayed in Winchester until after the Civil War. I mean, there was occupation troops in Winchester for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, the higher the attrition rate in the Confederate Army was pretty severe, but also in the Union Army, Sixth Corps, Nineteenth Corps. By the end of the war, they had to combine regiments, or else uh, reduce them down to, uh, the regiments down to battalion size. Like the, uh, for instance, the Ninth uh, Connecticut Infantry became a battalion, had like five five uh, companies, companies in it. And that was fairly common. And then at the end of the war, they had, I guess, uh, they still had recruits coming in. Uh, was, the draft was still ongoing. Yeah. And they brought in a lot of high number units from Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. Uh, one New York regiment had the, that was at Cedar Creek, had the, it was 189th New York regiment. Hmm. The, Getting uh, up there a little bit. Yeah. And they went and went over 200 uh, as far as New York and Pennsylvania. They had regiments na- numbered over 200. So it just shows the difference in their resources of manpower. Confederate uh, regiments, uh, as an example, the highest numbers that they got, Virginia was the, uh, I believe, 64th or 65th regiment of infantry. Wow. And uh, 
in North Carolina about maybe may may have reached the same uh, maybe into the seventies. But it just shows the difference in uh, manpower. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty much three to one. Wow. With um, Camp Russell, obviously, we didn't really talk much about Camp Avril. So okay. For folks that may have heard of Camp Avril or what's the relationship with it and Camp Russell um, and, you know, where was it located, things like that. Okay, what I know of Camp Avril was uh, he was a pretty good Union cavalry leader until he was uh, – Until he wasn't. Till <laughs> till after the Battle of Fisher's Hill when he didn't – catch up with all of Early's uh, retreating army. Yeah. So Sheridan wanted somebody else and one of one of his own men. But anyway, his Pal men takes over after that, right? His men must have thought well enough of him to name the camp after him, Camp yeah. Averill. And it's essentially where the uh Redbud Park is now. Is was their winter encampment. Yeah. And I understand it was one or two years it was occupied. Uh, by that time, they had learned to keep the soldiers away from the civilians. <laughs> they got along better. Because it was further away. I mean, where Mike's talking about Camp Avril being is roughly where, like, Millbrook High School or the first woods portion of the third Winchester Battlefield Park is today. Um, it's Camp Avril. You can actually still see some of the remnants right. of some huts and things like that and uh, right off along the trails. Mm-hmm. Um, which would have been pretty far away from the town of Winchester at the time. So they definitely kept their distance. Was Pal the one that took over after Averill? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, um, well, and Wilson was, uh, was replaced by a Merritt and, uh, and then Custer. Okay. Um, so Averill made some really good asphalt. He was the inventor of, I think, blacktop or something. Asphalt. Oh, really? Yeah, he invented yeah. he invented asphalt after huh. the war. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with, I guess, with your background, too, in, in archaeology, and you can answer what you want to or you can say you've heard about it, but um, what are some of the more interesting things metal detecting wise that have been found in these areas of, of camp Russell that have kind of brought more information to the scene of stuff we didn't know before. Well, there was a lot of uh, archeological studies done in the 1990s uh, because they were, you know, 37 was planned to be extended. I don't think they found a whole lot. In fact, they missed the archeologists at that time missed most of the camps because they were looking closer to a, a pecking creek and the forts where the encampments were further behind uh relic hunters of course have been in there for years and they gobbled up a lot of the good finds but archaeological wise they uh the best thing that came out of it was documentation of of the uh, when they did find camps and later on they came back and consulted with the uh, relic hunters and they found out a little bit more and, and went back and did further investigations but a lot of that area is undocumented, except on maybe the official atlas or some maps that were done in 1873. Um, where the GE plan is, all the factories now pretty much set on parts of Camp Russell. Mm-hmm. Um, it was close to the railroad track, which didn't exist at the time. Yeah. But it just and the and the transportation network just made it. Uh, a good place to for industry to go. Set up in, shop. In fact, uh, <clears throat> industry is you know they always say you, well you gonna have you have to have subdivisions you have to have a place for people to work so the county always tried to balance that. Mm-hmm. I love that because it's like you don't have to have either. <laughs> it's like yeah. you don't have to yeah. have. Well, this is economic development. I know. I don't concept. care. I don't care about that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Not for us. It's funny how people got along before economic development. You know, that was called the apple industry, uh, the lime industry. Of course, that's another story, too. But yeah. uh, those were the two main economic drivers in Frederick County after the you know 1900s. But uh, 81 is what changed it. 81 is what changed everything. It became a viable transportation corridor. And, uh, and now you'll see the uh, big warehousing mostly going in. I don't think it's creating so many jobs. But a lot of transportation, and and then the um, what else has 
built over uh, Camp Russell, uh, some housing, uh, which is continuing. So I don't know if Shenandoah Valley Battlefields or any preservation group has protected any of Camp Russell up to this point. I don't think there's, yeah. there's no land currently of, of physical resources from the camp. So mm-hmm. whether it be structures, entrenchments, hut sites, things like that, to, to our knowledge, nothing. And that's me as in like the preservation world. So mm-hmm. I can't speak because like if it even goes through like Kernstown and stuff too, you know, I don't know if there are those cultural resources or historical resources that do exist on like KBA's property or something like that. But you know, nothing to my knowledge has been protected. Well, it's pretty much would be south of KB, uh, Kernstown Battlefield Association. It's on I the think. other side of 37. Yeah, and I think between there and Peckin Creek or between there and Stephen City is the area where Camp Russell was and uh, over to 522. They called it the Peckin Line was another uh, name for it. And they were, you said they were there from no, early November? About November the 8th until... Uh, well, after the first of the year, they started withdrawing. Uh, the, the, the major portion of Sheridan's army either went back to Richmond or Petersburg or to Stevenson's Depot. There was still... Closer to the rail hub. Yeah. 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 And where did they... And catch us up for some folks that don't always, and we wouldn't, you know, whenever we do Cedar Creek as an episode, we probably won't talk about the aftermath. But can you fill us in a little bit more about positioning specifically at in the Middletown Cedar Creek area? And then, because obviously at the beginning of this episode, you talked about how they pulled from there to get closer yeah. to Stevenson's Depot by being, you know, yeah. where Camp Russell is. But where around Middletown and Cedar Creek after October 19th were they, the Federals, you know, were they going back to their original camps? Did they move? The Union Army after the Battle of Cedar Creek occupied their, their old camps. Of the, that morning assault, mm-hmm. and they stayed there. Uh, and but they sent elements of the Sixth Corps to Hupps Hill. And if you've been to Hupps Hill, it's called Battlefield Park. There's trenches there. That were they were trenches were built there after the Battle of Cedar Creek, because they that from that point they could keep a real good eye on General's Army at Fisher's Hill. Uh, you think about it; it was everywhere. Just everywhere, and for years after the Civil War, the civilians here plowing, plowing up bullets and, you know, probably remains Mm -hmm. from the battlefield. Horses died by the hundreds. There was more horses that died during the Civil War than humans. Mm -hmm. Um, So you see a brick, you know. Today you're out in the yard, and if you're in this area, and you say, well, what's this brick doing here? Well, it might have been a civil war encampment at one time mm-hmm. yeah uh but they took up the same alignment and actually it was getting back to your question sheridan's army as it marched up the valley towards harrisonburg after the battle of good, fisher's good Hill, direction there i like uh, that everybody you say down the valley going down people south. yell at you yeah <laughs> but uh the eighth corps was on the left side of the valley pike the 19th Court held the center, and the 6th Court held the right. And when they fell back down the valley, and that's when the burning took place, which was in early October, they fell back to Cedar Creek. They kept the same alignment as when they went towards Harrisonburg. So it was always the 8th Corps on the left, 19th Corps center, 19th, or 6th Corps on the right. And that's the same alignment they kept at Camp Russell huh. with, with cavalry on the flanks. And that was because of the road network, you know, the Front Royal Road, Bufflick Road, uh, Middle uh, and Cedar Creek Grade, and what was called uh, in Shenandoah County the back road. Hmm. So, uh, but can you imagine 35,000 men, may have been more or less because they'd lost, they had casualties, uh, uh, that's pretty. That's a pretty dense population. Mm-hmm. It's more than the population of Winchester today. Yeah. So <laughs> that is that's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, and I, I, this might be more of a broad question, but it helps us and it helps listeners probably understand a little bit more. Um, and you didn't cover it as much as I wanted you to. You do have an extensive archaeological background in professional archaeology. 
So I'm a, I have a vocational archaeologist. I've, whatever I've, worked, you I've call. worked with a lot of professional archaeologists. Yes. Yeah. So and, when it comes to camps and, and um, studies you've done and conducted, um, whether it be, you know, I think they can all relate a little. And, and maybe you've done stuff similar to Camp Russell, but what are the common trends you see from an archaeological perspective on, um, you know, on a camp when you're when you're metal detecting when you're doing STPs to a camp what what are um what what are you finding what are you looking for what's the well, trends lots of nails <laughs> nails tell the story yep. and I often say in bullets but of course the relic hunters all they're like they're hunters I mean I I was one am one some uh, you want the trophies uh, you want the big things you know it's you know what can you put on the wall and display it's mm-hmm. natural people are collectors. Uh, an archaeological, uh, from an archaeological perspective, a nail is just as important as a belt buckle in telling the story. But believe me, the archaeologists still like finding the belt buckles yeah, too. I'm sure. They do. <laughs> they just never find it. Yeah. <laughs> Very seldom. But uh, I was working with Dr. Geyer, uh, uh, Clarence Geyer of JMU, for a number of years at Cedar Creek. And uh, he taught me something that really was eye-opening to me. He said, well, you need to dig. We were hunting the Six Corps camp, uh, or surveying, if that's the proper word, mm-hmm. and uh, had a lot of st- working with the students. And uh, so he had the people that were familiar with metal detectors. Uh, it was pretty much called a 100% dig. You, you dug nails, every little thing you found. And I thought it was sort of strange that uh, why waste their time? So after it was all over, it, it was a three-year project, uh, he mapped everything out. And there on the, on the map are the company streets wow. laid out. Yeah, it's sort of like a ghost image. But that's what the nails told you, mm-hmm. where the occupation was. And there would be a void. There would be another company street where the melted lead was and some bullets and buttons. That's where they lived. So there's a whole layout of the camp. It was uh, it was amazing to me. And you could only see it really from uh, after, keeping track of where everything yeah, was found. They mapped everything. They're mapping in, it out. Which yes. So I know I know a lot of the guys today uh, do that. They can do it with their cell phones. And, That's what I use. Yeah. And it's because one of these days all this is going to be gone, not so much from relic hunting, but because of development. Mm-hmm. So what you're finding now, I think, is important to document. Uh, and you know, if, why is the Civil War history? Well, uh, a lot of men died. A lot of people have no idea what what happened here in the valley. That have moved in and they haven't studied it. But it affected uh, families that lived here for generations, generations, mm-hmm. and still somewhat. Uh, but it's it's changing now, and as the landscape changes, so do your views and attitudes of uh, what happened here. A lot of times. I mean, people see the city of Winchester now, and they have no idea that it was farmland up to Hanley yeah. uh, not too many years ago during the Depression. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you look at old aerial photographs, and you'll say, wow. Frederick County, uh, you know, the is now the fastest-growing county in the state of Virginia. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so all these sites are disappearing Every right day. before our yeah. eyes. And thank goodness, Shenandoah Valley Battlefields, American Battlefields, uh, some of the conservation groups are stepping up to try to protect us for the future. National Park Service, of course, yeah. is at Bell Grove and uh, Cedar Creek. Uh, I remember when uh, Manassas Battlefield was just like, you know, nothing there. Manassas was just a little sleepy town. Not anymore. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and if it wasn't for the National Park there... That's their main green space. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's to be able to make those physical, but then emotional connections with what took place. And it's really not that long ago. I was talking to a woman yesterday um, over at the museum and she, uh, she was there for an event. She lives in Winchester now. She's not from here. She's from New York and she moved to Winchester and then doing some family history, found out that her ancestor, like her direct great grandfather was killed at the third battle of Winchester. Wow. So it's like, you know, these people have no idea. And some people have no idea. There's a, a couple battlefield parks here in the Valley. Lo and behold, 
there should be, you know, over 20 mm-hmm. for the amount of battles and, and fights that, t- that took place. There here. was more battles here. This was a four-year battlefield. Yeah. Four-year war right here. A lot of places, it was just one one year, two years. But like here, Gettysburg, one and done. Yeah. Four years. Hey, that's, that's pretty good stuff after the third uh, yeah. little sip. <laughs> yeah. Mike, Mike plowed through it. It grows on you. Um, Mike, I want to talk a little bit about some of your, your works that are available for people um, published works that is, uh, did, you helped with the Fisher's Hill and the Cedar Creek, um, archeological report books, right? Yes. So that I'll talk about those. We've got Fisher's Hill, the story of a battlefield, and that's by Clarence Geyer and Joe Whitehorn. And you've collaborated with mm-hmm. them on that. Um, that's available on at Shenandoah at war.org. Um, when you go to learn, the learn tab on the website and then go to articles. It's the first one or two up there. Um, tell us a little bit about your work on that one, the Fisher's Hill one. Well, I, I lived at Fisher's Hill for 10 years, so I was real familiar with the ground. You lived everywhere, right? Well, no. everywhere and nowhere all at <laughs> once. <laughs> I lived at, recently where the fire was at Coal Mine Hollow. That was. Yeah, the valley's on fire 160 yeah. years later, yeah. folks. So Sheridan came back the other day. <laughs> but, uh, I was pretty familiar with the ground there and where the trench lines and Fisher's Hill is still one of the more pristine battlefields. Mm-hmm. It's still yeah. uh, there, visible. It's a lot of it's in private hands, and the people, most of them, are pretty responsible and, and are aware of what they have on their land. Um, on the northern side, there were some trenches where uh, Sheridan had built. It was only a two-day battle. It was a Two day battle, twenty first and twenty second, instead yeah. of a one day battle. September. But the Union Army actually built trenches there as well. Uh, it was all it was known as the G- Gibraltar of the South of mm-hmm. the Valley, and not so. It might have been if Sheridan hadn't lost the Battle of Winchester and five four or five thousand men. But early, early, you mean early? I'm yeah, sorry. There you go. See, I think this started yeah. to work on me. <laughs> Mike's on his fifth pour over. No, there. <laughs> <laughs> just give me the bottle. I know. Um, Anyway, uh, Shenandoah Valley Battlefields has done a really great job of getting easements and trying to acquire uh, as much of that property uh, at Fisher's Hill that's significant for the battle, I think. Yeah. And uh, you need to be commended. Uh, people, land's getting more expensive all the time. Yeah. So it's, I don't know how they do it, but they're, they're saving land. Well, that one as a whole is one of the more, or one of the lesser developed battlefields in the valley as far as you know yeah. you don't see a housing development or something sitting on uh, the main portions of that battle. yeah that's yeah. true large lot developments really that's yeah what's affecting that yeah uh, so um was there a big takeaway from that fisher's hill book that you had to make sure that guyer and whitehorn got across when they were putting that book together is there something that you were like you got to look at it from this way and not this well, way. Well, they approach it from a, the terrain and archaeological perspective. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but it's one of the more uh, involved books, I think, about the Battle of Fisher's Hill. I mean, I've, it's a couple hundred pages, a lot of pictures, lots of pictures, a lot of maps, and it's digital. Mm-hmm. So you can actually zoom in on it. If there's an old map you can, or a picture, you can zoom in mm-hmm. and see better. Yeah, so that's the Fisher's Hill, which is the story of a battlefield. Then we've got a military history of the events along Cedar Creek um, by Geyer Whitehorn and you. And then the forward is by Park Service, former Park Service uh, historian Dennis Fry. What about what about that one? I think that was done. How long ago was that one done? The Cedar Creek one. It just came out last fall. Oh my gosh! Well, yeah. losing track of the days. I know. So tell us a little bit about that one. Well, it's not only about the archaeology of, of just the Battle of Cedar Creek. Uh, they we went into the historic background. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, colonial times, the old road networks, and what what happened, uh, the Height family. So it's it's just more than just about the Civil War, but then it got into the terrain and the locations of the troops and what happened during the battle. So some back and forth fighting. So it, it's pretty interesting. If you just want to read about that and not about the archaeology, it sort of blends the both both together and a lot of what was found. 
uh, during the arche archaeological investigations. But one of the things, uh, if I remember, was uh, Merritt's camp, uh, where the uh, cavalry camp was uh, west of, of uh, Middletown, the number of horseshoes that were found. And uh, you wouldn't think, well, it's just a horseshoe, but they were able to, by that, determine where the cavalry, uh, uh, for, what is it called, blacksmith, farriers, shops hmm. were. Well, and uh, not so much the different camps uh, because a lot of it was already developed or under a berm, mm -hmm. but we were able to find a lot of the cavalry camps and before it was further being uh, quarried out. So that information is is important. Yeah, and that's you've almost created, you've almost preserved a battlefield in words in a way and mm -hmm. with pictures too um right. because cedar creek's one of those ones i mean winchester's pretty you know we know what's available preservation wise we know what still can be done what's possible mm -hmm. cedar creek you could drive by one day on the interstate and you know it's an empty field and then the next day there's 50 homes or a warehouse so that's one of those ones that if you asked me five years ago i never would have thought cedar creek was on the back burner for future development uh, but it was just waiting. I mean, I feel like all the slips were in play. All the rezonings were ready to go. It was just a matter of time before they hit go on, you know, there's hundreds of new homes, you know, if being If you would look on Frederick up. County's tax map yeah, on Cedar Creek grade, you'll see all those farms out there have already been subdivided. Yeah. And for housing. It's just ready. It's just a matter of time. Yeah, yeah I'm just waiting for the time. Yeah. So so that's, you've almost, with, with the work you and... and um, Clarence and Joe have done with that Cedar Creek one. It's really captured, you know, an idea of what this battlefield landscape, well, and it's a shame. It truly is a shame what's happening there. And, um, it's one that I wish, you know, I don't know. I wish the organizations that are now there existed 20 years earlier, you know, yeah. it's just, I don't know how you would have fixed well, it. Well, I think in Frederick County in the nineties did a lot of work to document what was there. But since then, I think they've sort of, I'm sorry, Frederick County. I think you all are sort of slipping up and, uh, you know, for the pressures of development. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The modernization uh, is because I'm basically. hearing rumors now from the local people that lived here all their lives that they just are tired of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that modernization and that development is definitely outpacing what the county or any but any organization can really do to counteract that, you know, and document and gather the information. That well, you I need think from cats out of the bag scene. now, though. I mean, it really, yeah. uh, if you want to see the future of Frederick County, just look east of here. Yeah, yeah. So, well, east of Clark County. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Clark County did, but they did something right and <laughs> didn't, have, that, the, didn't ha have the interstate. Yeah, half that county is. Yeah, that's what it is. That and then if, if you want to see Frederick County, go to Berkeley County. If you want to see what's going to happen. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And then one more, one more book of yours that I want to push, and that's um, this is just you, dead, wounded, and captured, casualties at the Battle of Cedar Creek, October nineteenth, eighteen sixty four. And that's by you, Mr. Kehoe, with the with the preface by uh, Clarence and then Joe uh, coming back for for that. Uh, tell us tell us a little bit about that. I remember talking to you. I think it was pre COVID about you putting all these numbers together, and um, you know it's exciting to see something. So tell us a little bit more about this one. Well, it all started uh, again back when I was growing up. There was a stone marker on the farm next to us it just had initials on it gpm mm -hmm. october 19th 1864 and then the date 1865 and uh so who was gpm the the local lore was that he was a, a soldier that had lost an arm or a leg or something and came back in 1905 but nobody knew the name uh, mrs kearns who i remember when i was uh, real young she was 94 years old she remembered when the soldier had come back and brought it, left it there you know, on a, beside a tree, was supposedly where he was shot. So I was able to just, out of curiosity over the years, I was looking in regimental histories, trying to match up the initials. And uh, never wasn't successful, but with the internet, you know, it opened up a lot of more resources, regimental histories, 
And so I started trying to match up names, and for years I even was unsuccessful. Looked at every regiment in the Eighth Corps that might have been in that area. That's who was in that part of the battle. Nothing matched up. Uh, finally, I said, well, maybe he was a Confederate soldier, and that's a little harder to find. And, and this is going on for years. Yeah. Uh, wasn't a Confederate. So then I said, well, maybe he was an artillery fellow, artilleryman. And lo and behold, it turned out that his name was George P. Morgan of the Company D, 1st Pennsylvania Artillery. Well, by that time, I had looked at thousands of names, thousands of names, <laughs> that people had wounded at, at Cedar Creek. And somewhere during that time period, I said, well, you know, I'm already looking at these names. Why don't I write them down? And that's what I started doing. So by the uh, 115th, 150th anniversary of Cedar Creek, I had documented, cataloged a number of Union and, and Confederate names for the, for the 150th. And um, Park Service uh, had a big list, to sort of like the, the, the wall on the Vietnam Monument wall. Mm -hmm. The Park Service did something for the 150th with all the, in a tent with all the names. And it was just amazing to see that. Well, of course, that wasn't all of them. And uh, so since that time, I continued to um, gather names and find them. So I have 100% of the soldiers that were killed, wounded, and missing at Cedar Creek. And that's and, what this, this book yeah, is, right? Yeah. Published last year, 2023. Yeah. And it also has in there the, where they were buried or supposedly, if, if, if it's known, their rank. Any information I could put in there, it's it's that's the condensed volume because it's on a spreadsheet and it's you just couldn't get it all on one page. Mm -hmm. But I also did the same thing f for what I could find out about the Confederate soldiers. And doing all this research, I've learned a lot about the Civil War. You know, just not uh, about relic hunting. It's about the history of the units and what happened to them. I didn't stop there. I've, I just keep on going. <laughs> have, you, have you kept going? Is there anything next? What's next for, for Mike Kehoe? Well, Fisher's Hill. Fisher's Hill's done. Uh, probably Tom's Brook, which uh, B uh, Bill Miller also did that. Mm -hmm. he, in the back of his book are the casualties for both uh, North and South at the Battle of Tom's Brook. But I have Fisher's Hill. I have uh, updated all the casualties that are in the cemetery at Winchester, National Cemetery, both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done Third Winchester? Not all of it. That's no. uh, coming soon. That's is that coming soon? Very time consuming. I <laughs> Maybe if I live Maybe. long enough. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but it just when you see the casualty list, you can see the units that were hit hard mm -hmm. or did the hard fighting, just yeah. by the number of casualties, mm -hmm. and it tells a story. And uh, and then if you had the extended Excel version, you see well. These guys, we don't know where they're buried. Yeah, you know, still out there potentially. Mm -hmm. Potentially, or pro probably um, most of them are in the cemeteries at, mm -hmm. at Stonewall or or um, oh. uh, National Cemetery as uh, as unknowns. You go to the National Cemetery over here off of uh, Berryville Avenue, and you look out. It's about half of it are have stones that are with markers, known, you know, names, and the other half are unknown. Just little small blocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one more question to tie in um, Camp Russell and kind of the work you're doing with your casualties list. What is there any, and have you started a kind of a log of the ones killed by disease or taken out during this kind of non-engaged period, but in camp? Well, that's another list. You know, if you start something and you go through the information, write it down because, uh, which I do on Excel. I mm -hmm. use that all the time uh, because you may come back to it later. So I have a list of all the Union soldiers that died in the valley. It's over about 7,000 from Harpers Ferry to uh, Stanton. And uh, so I think it's around six or 7,000. It's in between. There's more, you know, finding more all the time. The uh, 
Confederates are approaching 13,000. Wow. And the difference is the uh, people that died at home, that uh, the Confederates uh, were brought back, died in the hospitals or at home or buried at home. The Union soldiers, uh, a lot of them were sent to hospitals in Baltimore or Philadelphia, and they, were, they died of disease there mm-hmm. or injuries. But, of course, there was a lot more than six or 7,000 Unions that were casualties here. That's just that they didn't die here. Yeah. Technicalities. Yeah. That's a lot, though. It is. And, yeah. you know, if you go, I don't know how many people go to the National Cemeteries and really look at them, but they should. Yeah. Jack and I took a trip to the, to the uh, Confederate, the Stonewall Cemetery, just to kind of look at it. And, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that is very sobering to see. I mean, because each one of yeah. those, it's not just a stone marker. That's a, there's a person there. Yeah. And each person has, you know, brothers, sisters, mother, father, kids, whatever the case may be. Each person has a story behind them, and they ended up here in the valley. And yeah, I mean, especially those ones that are not from here. So whether you're talking about all the National Cemetery where all the federal soldiers are buried, or you're looking at any other state besides Virginia, or the Virginia ones that are not from the valley, mm-hmm. those people, you know, who knows if their family ever, ever got to visit their grave or knew they were buried here. Um, yeah, like Elijah said, it's very sobering. And uh, that's why these places matter. You know, you can't just lump it all in a cemetery. These people experience something. It's really what defined our nation and makes us who we are today. Um, so that's why it's important to go to places like cemeteries, but also battlefields and, you know, learn from it and, and remember it. And, you know, how can you make yourself better to make, you know, others better? When it's easy to, I know we had mentioned this in another episode, it's easy to look at, you know, casualty reports and, you know, see a number on paper and that's that. To have know, a name, but to have a name or to go to a cemetery and look at each well, individual. It's like when you number. go to the Vietnam, Vietnam Memorial in in, uh, mm-hmm. in DC, it affects you a lot more. Yeah, when you yeah. see all those names, it's more um, than just ink on paper. Yeah, it's the physical evidence or of it. Or a number, the number. That, yeah. yeah. But anyways, <laughs> it's a site, and it was uh, Vermont did this. Some fellow up in Vermont did the same thing, and uh, the Vermont people are very proud of their history. Civil War history. Mm-hmm. They lost a lot of soldiers. And he had a site called Less We Forget. And he did the same thing for every Vermont soldier. I think it was about 25,000, whether they were killed, wounded, died, or, you know, survived. I don't see it on online anymore. Unfortunately, it's t- been taken down. Something's happened to it. But that was uh, very helpful in this research I was doing about Vermont soldiers. Yeah. And it's funny, uh, people from Vermont came down a few years ago to Cedar Creek and they're real proud of, you know, the, the union side and what their, their men did for the war. And they, of course, the eighth Vermont monument is there at Cedar Creek. And, uh, I was saying Vermont, you know, Ver, Virginia, Vermont. They didn't like how I pronounced it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this one lady, she says, you don't say it that way. And I said, well, how do you, how do you say the, uh, State you're in right now. She goes, Virginia. <laughs> I said, wrong. <laughs> wrong. Yeah. No, and I love that connection. And we'll talk about it whenever we do a Cedar Creek episode is the connection between Vermont and, and that battle and the connection it still holds today. I mean, that's, that's, it's like a sense of, it's like a little slice of their own state down here. They've adopted the battle mm-hmm. in their own way. It's very fascinating. Yeah, you go to their state house. Yep. There's a big Painting. Bureau. A huge painting of the Battle of Cedar Creek. Yeah, it's it's incredible. But, um, Mike, is there anything else you want to add about Camp Russell, which you want the listeners to know? Anything else you want them to know besides about Camp Russell? Well, if you have an interest in, in where you live, read up about it. It yeah. might be more than you know. Especially with all the developments going around Camp yeah. Russell. You know, not a lot of these people know exactly where they yeah. live and what they're living on. So, yeah. um with with that, I think we've all enjoyed our uh, Catoctin Creek Roundstone Rye, the ninety two proof. Mike drink it all. I've still got a little bit to finish here, but um, I think we think it was good. I'm not the one that burped. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a good one though. Um, we've got uh, like Elijah said at the beginning of the episode, we've got uh, loose cannons coming up on when April Saturday, April sixth. Saturday, April sixth. Uh, so get your tickets now. 
uh, that is in our what do we call it our link, link tree link tree in our bio in our bios you'll be able to get those so um, anything else you want to add Elijah no I think that was pretty pretty solid as far as you know whiskey civil war history and uh, some you know extracurriculars yeah for sure well we appreciate everyone listening to episode 20 we are excited to get more out to you all and um as it warms up we've got a lot more battle anniversaries coming up and some more western theater battles to talk about so plenty of good ones oh yeah i got 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 a got a good amount of battles lined up so we appreciate y'all listening don't forget to like and share with your friends and uh, reach out to us if you ever have questions or comments or you know suggestions so i uh, appreciate you listening and we'll catch you on the next one thanks